Good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, if you've been following uh, my channel for a while, you know that I like to deal with paper negatives in old cameras or homemade cameras. For instance, pictures like this taken with this old folding roll film camera using a makeshift shutter mechanism so I can get a roughly two second timed exposure, self-timed, controlled remotely with a string, a set of threads that I pull to activate the shutter. I love doing this stuff, doing self-portraits. This is three inches by five inches, roughly. Uh, it's a very small image. I'd like to be able to do this on a larger format camera. For instance, my eight by 10 inch sliding box camera. I'd love to make a self-operated, remotely controlled via thread or string shutter system for that camera. This is the camera in question. This is a sliding box camera made from laser cut plywood that is based on my prototype camera. And Ethan Moses helped me build this. It has an adjustable film back. Basically, you can pull out the rear half, rotate it around to make a portrait oriented film plane. But in the front of the camera, I'm using this Xerox lens. This is a Fujinon Xerox machine lens. It is 24 centimeter focal length at f4.5. It's a fixed f-stop. You cannot put waterhouse stops in it because of the design of the lens. So what I'm in the process of doing here is making a board here so I can attach a homemade shutter to it. So this uh, lens attaches to the front of the camera with these sliding brackets that uh, enable you to pull the lens board out. So this plywood here is the lens board itself. We have a 3D printed bracket that helps hold the Fujinon lens in place right here. And then what I've done uh, last week is I made this makeshift shutter panel out of two layers of foam core board that are screwed into place using the same screws that hold the 3D printed lens mount to the lens board itself. So I have this rectangular surface I can use to attach my makeshift shutter to, and that brings us to the point of let's take a look at what I'm gonna use for a shutter. Well, the little folding Kodak camera used a gravity-powered shutter, a heavy metal washer sliding in a slot. But the way this camera is configured with those lens board clips, those wooden sliding pieces above and below the lens itself, I couldn't really use it for a falling shutter gravity powered. So I'm going to be using some elastic rubber bands to operate a horizontally sliding shutter. And it's going to have basically similar kind of technology. So the folding camera's shutter had a lens cap that you popped off and then it had a slide, a gravity powered slide that you pulled the string to operate to close it. I'm gonna use two slides. One of is gonna be, uh, when it's set, it'll be closed. And when you pull the string, the rubber band will pull it open. And then the second uh, slide behind it will be normally open. And when you pull it, it will slide closed. So I have this prototype type mocked up and uh, let's show you how it works. The heart of this shutter is this cardboard slide holder. This has five layers of cardboard so there's two slots and those slots allow these thin pieces of plastic, black plastic, to slide in them. Each piece of plastic has a hole. The front slide is the opening slide and the back slide is the closing slide. So they're operated by rubber bands. I have super glued some rubber bands to the edge of the slides. I have them set temporarily just on this cutting board just as a way of testing the shutter before I install it in the camera. So I'm using a bulldog clip temporarily to hold these rubber bands in a tensioned position. This block of wood here is clamped in place. This is the stopping block so when the uh, slides are operated they stop here and then what I have on this piece of wood here on the left, I have two holes drilled in here and these are for these little brass rods that are going to be the rods that we actually use to hold the slides in the cocked position and release them. So I'm going to first take the bottom slide, which is the closing slide, and I'm going to slide it out and engage this brass pin in the hole and this holds the slide in the open position. So this is the closing slide held into the open position. And then I'm going to slide the front slide, which is the, the one that starts the exposure. And it 
comes out like this and it has a hole for its brass rod. So now to operate the slide you will first pull the opening slide that operates the starts the exposure 1001, 1002 and then you will operate the closing slide to end the exposure. The distance from the edge of the shutter to the stopping block is designed so that when I operate the shutter it will stop it in such a position that the hole for the lens opening is exactly covered by the shutter blade. So it looks like it's going to be pretty reliable, I hope. I just need to locate these two holes into the front of the camera itself. So here's the cardboard shutter slide holder. It has five layers. You can see the shutter slides themselves with their glued on rubber bands sliding in those respective slots. So each shutter slide has a hole for its rod to hold it in place, and then it has the other hole, has a cutout notch, so the other slide that's on top of it can move freely without being held by this slide. So here you can see the bottom slide is held in place while the top slide is free to move, like that. So now in order to mount the shutter to the camera, I have to mount the shutter piece here onto the black foam core such that then there are two holes I have to drill into the front of the camera to receive the brass rods at the precise distance that these are set at so the shutter will operate correctly. And also to make a stopping block on the other side of the camera that's the precise distance to stop these shutter blades so that the holes in the shutter blades line up with the lens. And also I need to have a bracket extend out to the left side of the camera to hold the rubber bands in a stretched position. This bracket doesn't have to be permanently mounted. It can be mounted in such a way that it can be taken off when the camera is not in use. Okay, so I have the stopping shutter cocked and with the opening in the stopping shutter centered onto the opening in the shutter itself, the shutter holder, the distance from the edge of the cardboard holder to the holes that need to be drilled are about 14 millimeters, it looks like. So 14 millimeters from the edge of this cardboard to the center of these holes. And I'm gonna be using this larger brass tube that fits snugly over these brass rods. I'm gonna actually be drilling a hole in the camera front and in the foam core and glue in a piece of this tubing so that I can then have the brass rod held in there nicely and I can just pull it out. And then the stopping block is gonna be set at such a position that with the opening in the shutter blade centered onto the frame of the shutter holder, it's gonna be about 29, let's say 30, millimeters from the edge of this cardboard. Okay, well, I have the shutter temporarily set on top of the foam core. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to manually have both blades in the open position either side so the opening is set and I just need to center this on the opening in the foam core and that'll kind of dictate how I attach the cardboard to the foam core and that brings up the question of how am I going to do that. I was going to you know maybe use wood glue and glue it but I think I'm going to use uh, initially this double-sided sticky tape. I'm just going to lay out this double-sided st sticky tape. I'm going to cut it. You know, this is not as much fancy woodworking or anything like that. It's, it's just kind of paper crafting. It's a camera shutter that's essentially cardboard and thin plastic. And oh, by the way, you're wondering probably what kind of thin plastic I'm using for these shutter blades. Well, if you go to your office supply store and you look for these three ring binder notebooks that have the flexible plastic covers. So these are these black kind of uh, portfolio report covers made of plastic. I bought the entire store supply out at the Dollar General store in my neighborhood. This black plastic is what I'm using for these shutter blades. It's very inexpensive, easy to find. And yes, there's a possibility that this could come loose sometime down the road, but uh, this is like a prototype. It's a paper crafted prototype shutter. Okay, so the 
Shutter blades are open. I'm eyeing the parallelism here and I'm eyeing the hole in the shutter and the hole in the foam core. I'm just going to just eyeball it and stick it down. Okay, so this is the closing shutter. I have the opening in the shutter blade centered on the opening in the uh, shutter holder. I'm going to use a whiteout pin. So the hole here is about the size of my brass tube. So I'm going to mark that. I'm going to let this dry and then I'm going to mark the position for the other shutter blade. So here is the positions of the two holes I have to drill marked by the white spots. And this is the outer sleeve tube. I'm going to cut this into two pieces, one for each rod. But just looking how far down it has to go, this edge here of the wood represents the back side of the front camera body. So I'm just going to measure basically from here up to flush with the surface of the foam core. That'll be the length of these sleeves. And you also want the sleeve tube to not protrude above the level of the foam core because you don't want the slides hanging up on this sleeve. Okay, so I'm going to mark the very centers of the white spots with a sharpened pencil and then use the tip of the pencil to poke through this layer of gaffer's tape. And that will guide my pilot drill bit. So my pilot drill bit is a 1 16th inch drill bit. My main drill bit is 1 8th inch. The outside diameter of my tubing is 1 8th inch. And I'm setting the length of my pilot bit to the length of my brass sleeve so I can penetrate the correct distance. And because my full-size drill bit is too long to retract properly for the pro proper depth of drilling, I'm just marking the drill bit with a piece of tape. I'll drill down to the edge of the tape and that'll be the right distance into the camera. Nice. I think it's important to point out that the position of the hole relative to the holder is very important on the closing slide in order to get the hole in the slide centered on the opening in the shutter. Whereas with the opening slide, what's actually important to get its opening centered on the shutter is the stopping block. Okay, one of the most important things you need for building these kinds of homemade projects is a bin with a bunch of spare scraps of wood in it from all the previous projects that I've built and then disassembled and put the parts back in the box just to be reused for other projects. So one example of the kinds of scraps that might work is this is a little scrap of wood that was used in my Royal KMM typewriter box project that Ethan Moses helped me build. But it's the perfect kind of spacer to where, let's say I put it here and I put this wedge block here, let's say right above it like that, that this will be the perfect spacing that I need for my stop block. The tip of the block out here, I can clip the rubber bands to stretched out using the bulldog clip. So I'm going to glue these two pieces together to make one block. And then I'm going to have a couple mounting holes and I'm going to mount some threaded inserts into the side of the camera body. And I'm going to use some thumb screws so I can attach this plate to the side of the camera with thumb screws whenever I want to mount this block that will serve both as a stopping block and as a place to secure the rubber bands when they're stretched out. So I want to mount this so the top of the wood is flush with the top of the foam core. And then, of course, my wedge block will be higher, like that. I'd like to use the existing holes here, like these two here, for the thumb screws. And also, you have the two rubber bands coming out like this. I'd like to put this bracket right next to them, so they'll stretch out. And then I can attach them to the end of the extension with a clip here.
Well, going through my uh, collection of spare parts, I do have these nut certs that are 1024 sized on the actual inner thread. So I could use those and I'll have to get some 1024 screws or thumb screws. I think I have these brass screws here and I'll probably just put a set of nuts on here to set the depth of it. Okay, so the solid middle part of this threaded insert is what I need to drill my pilot hole for, or my hole for to thread it into. I'm measuring the thickness of this middle part to be about 5.8 millimeters. And the smallest Forstner bit I have is, looks like 6.1. So 0.3 millimeters larger but it still gives me plenty of room for the threads to cut into the wood, hopefully. Okay, so there's my 1 16th inch pilot drill bit. This is about as far in as I can put the drill bit in the chuck, so I'm gonna leave about two millimeters. I'm not gonna go all the way to the end of the collet here. Okay, so I've marked out a little rectangle in pencil where this wedge is going to be get glued to like that. Wait for it to dry. Okay, line this up with the pencil marks. Try to get the glue spread evenly. And I'm sure we have too much glue. Okay, hopefully that'll hold. Well, so I think this might be dry enough that I can try test fitting, or I do want to put probably a couple little screws in here just to hold this, but I think it's dry enough if I'm careful with it. Maybe. This might work. Looks like it'll be long enough to go well into the wood and it's not such a big diameter and it's the countersunk style. Okay, so this is the countersinking bit that I'm going to use to countersink the head of it. We want the drill bit to be the diameter of the inner shank of the screw so that the threads will cut into the walls of the hole. And that looks like the right size. I've taped the wedge to a block of wood so that it has a flat base to sit on. And I have the hole marked right here. Well, okay, so it's flush, countersunk, I can mount it to the side of the camera. So I'm gonna put a little lock washer between the two nuts here. This will keep the nuts from loosening and also add a little bit of extra thickness, which should be about perfect for making these the right length to hold that bracket in place on the side of the camera. Like that. All right. Hey, there it is. And now I can clip my rubber bands onto the end of it. And I have a stopping block here. Okay, there's one usability issue that I want to address on this camera before I uh, start using it, which is to reset the shutters, to recock them. So the inside shutter, which is the closing shutter, it's easy to get your finger into the edge of the inner hole and push it out like this, and then easily put the metal rod in, 
and lock it in place. But the opening shutter, when you push it in like this, you can only go so far with it and you can't really get a grip on it, right? That's not really easy to do. So what I have done is tied a double knot, super glued it, and a little handle, this washer is a handle. There's a tiny little thread here and it's attached to the end of the slide. There's a little hole punched in the slide with my eighth inch hole puncher. I have the string of the thread double knotted and glued on that hole, so now I can pull the slide back. Okay, let's try this. Opens up, and then we pull it, the closed thing. And our little handle just hangs there in the balance. So now we can push the closing shutter back and lock it into place like that. And then we'll get the handle on the opening shutter and we can open it like that. So I have one pull string that operates both shutter blades. Let's try this again, shall we? Yay! Well, because it's after 5 p.m. today, it's already dark out. I don't have time now to do some test exposures. We're going to have to do this tomorrow morning. So we're going to have to move this video forward to tomorrow morning. So I guess it's time for me to just go to sleep now, wake up tomorrow morning. Huh? Oh, hi. Oh, yeah. It is next morning. We have some pictures that we need to take. Let's do it. Well, before I uh, get the camera set up outside and start uh, taking some self-portraits with this new shutter, I need to get my darkroom set up, so I'm going to be doing 8x10 paper negatives. I could just set out some trays, but, you know, I haven't used this in a while. So, I have this Jobo 4x5 test print developing tank, and I also have this extension so that it enables me to use this for 8x10 and this will hold two 8x10 prints and you rotary process it. I, I just twist it manually or spin it by hand on a base and uh, so it uses less chemistry than trays and gives good results. So I'm going to try that. I'm going to develop it out here on the garage workbench instead of in my uh, dark room. So yeah, I'll get all set up with my chemicals and then we'll get the camera set up. Okay, so the way this works is you take the lid off the 4x5 tank and you put this in place of it, and then you lock this in place, and then you put the lid on top of it. Like that. And now it'll take eight by tens. And if you've put it on right, the ridges along the side of the tank that hold the prints in place should extend all the way down to the 4x5 part of the tank in the bottom, so they're all contiguous. Well, so I took a meter reading outside in the shade, and it turns out this morning is too bright for me to use an exposure time of over one second, so that means I'm going to try using this indoor. Now, I have my workbench illuminated by LED lighting, and when I take a meter reading at ISO 10, I get at f4.5, I get about two seconds, which is kind of what I wanted. I have the camera set up on the Bruno's pneumatic tripod. It has a nice, sturdy, big base for big box cameras like this. So I'm going to make an initial exposure on one sheet of paper, develop it, and see what I get. Okay, the focus is preset. My uh, slides are both set. I just have to set the spring tension. So I'm going to open up the dark slide. <laughs> little wobbliness there. Okay, now we're going to set the rubber band tension. Wrap it around the holder there. All right, now we will get our strings set. Okay, position my head. Two second exposure. Here we go. 1001, 1002. All right.
Okay, so this extended tank takes 100 milliliters. So that's what I have in these cups here. And two minutes in the developer, 30 seconds in the stop bath, two minutes in the fixer. And I have some water rinses between each step. That's about 30 seconds. I do the water rinses just to keep the chemistry from being contaminated so I can use it more. Okay, let's see what we got here. Looks promising. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Focus on my face is really good. Exposure looks really good. You can see my hand probably holding the, uh, the spool of thread and my other hand is holding the my focusing target and that's probably the string of the focusing target wow a good picture well i gotta rinse this and then we can see about getting a, a print made of it okay so i was using a, a focusing target that is this little battery powered led flashlight and i had actually used the video camera's tripod i set it up with this light hanging from the tripod at the same height that my eyes would be in the, seated in the chair and I had it stretched so this string connected to the uh, box camera's tripod is nice and tight so then when I went to do my exposure of course I don't have the light on I don't need it on when I'm all I have to do is hold the front of this up to my eyes to my even with my eyes adjust my position back and forth so the string is tight then I lower this and use my other hand to do the exposure, operate the shutter. And this is another discipline that you need to do when you're using these sliding box cameras is once you have the focus set on the ground glass, you need to set a clamp right here like that to the clamp setting so you have the right focal point. Okay, it's about ready to come out of the fixer into the holding tray. Well, here is print, contact print. Okay, it needs rinsing. Well, I'm rinsing these prints and I didn't want to waste the water and my tree needed to be watered. Well, it was an interesting project. Uh, you know, these 8x10 box cameras are very interesting. You get the satisfaction of making them yourself, right? But they're actually, at least with my camera and the kind of shutter I'm using, it's less capable than the cheapest plastic camera like a Holga. A Holga has an instantaneous shutter speed and a bulb setting and two f-stops. This camera only has a bulb setting, a fixed f-stop because of the kind of lens it's using. So it's less capable than a Holga. But it's fun being able to handcraft things and make your own, in this case, 8x10 contact prints selfies, right? That was a lot of fun. If I had things to do over again, well, one of the things I was surprised about is that I didn't go out with my light meter before I started this project. Because when I came out this morning looking at the early morning shaded daylight on the north side of the house, it was way too fast, uh, way too much light. At f4.5, I would have needed like an eighth of a second shutter speed. So instead of using it as an outdoor camera, I went indoors into the garage and I'm using the LED lights over my workbench with a little bit of indirect daylight coming through the windows of my garage door. And it was plenty sufficient light for a two second exposure at f4.5. In fact, what's great about it is I don't need high powered studio lighting with this kind of a setup. Just kind of bright, normal indoor light seems to work fine. One of the reasons might be because this lens I'm using is a Fujinon Xerox machine lens and the coatings on the lens are optimized for a Xerox machine which uses like UV light and blue light. So I think the coatings transmit more light than a pictorial photographic lens, which tries to, at least modern lenses, try to filter out some of the UV light. Any event, it is a lot of fun having the ability to do these paper negatives very inexpensively. And then contact printing is something that I hadn't done much of recently. 
And so it took me a few tries to get a decent contact print, but I was happy with it. Okay, so the contact print is on Ilford Multigrade Warm Tone RC Paper. I'm using, this was a, a grade of four, grade four filtering. It was a nice uh, contact print. It was, it was fun doing it. Uh, I had, of course, to set up for my contact printing, I had to clean my glass, my plates of glass. They had been laying around. They are full of dust and fingerprints. I had to do a lot of cleaning before I could start it. And I poured up the, the cube tray stack uh, for the contact printing developing in the darkroom. But it was fun getting back in, in the hand, my hand of contact printing. Very cool. Well, so this camera going forward, um, it is a selfie camera right now, but it can also be used to take pictures of other people. In fact, it's easier to operate that way. And there's also the possibility that um, if I make some plastic shutter slides with little slit apertures, maybe I can get sub one second exposure times. But in order to do that, the tension of the rubber bands or maybe metal springs might be better. It has to be more consistent and it has to be repeatable, right? Well, in any event, it was a fun project. I'm going to work more with this camera. You'll probably see more of this in the future. But if you're interested in making your own box cameras and doing paper negative portraits, if you have any questions about that, drop a comment down below. I'd love to have a dialogue with you about it. In any event, stay creative, have yourselves a great day, and bye-bye for now.